They say that the news never sleeps, and today I feel like reporters never sleep. Um, hopefully what I'm talking about today won't put you guys to sleep. It's not the brightest of topics. The rise and meltdown of freedom of the press in Japan. I have been a reporter here for 22 years now, which is longer than many of the college students here who are helping have been alive, um, and seen Japan go through some interesting changes. All right, let's get to the basics here. I'm looking at the time and I'll probably go over it. What is journalism? Is it this? Journalism is what someone once printed. No, that is not journalism. If Burger King is coming out with a new all red burger, or all green burger, they want that printed. There's plenty of media organizations that are happy to write that up. That is not news. Uh, this is the cover of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan issue about the Freedom of Press Awards, which we had this year, the first time we've ever had Freedom of Press Awards, because we felt that freedom of press in Japan was so in danger that we should do something about it to promote um, the action. For those of you who don't know the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, the Gaikoku Tokain Kyokai, um, it's kind of like a retirement home for old folks, um, <laughs> meaning journalists like myself. But sometimes we actually do really important things and have people speak there who no Japanese news organization would allow to speak at their forums. So what is journalism? It's not what someone wants print. Journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations. Now, actually, the question of who really said this, whether it's George Orwell or um, the former chief editor of the Washington Post, is disputed. But the sentiment is correct. Journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is PR. What are kind of stories in Japan that people don't want printed? Um, they don't want printed that at the Fukushima nuclear meltdown, that the first reactor melted down because all the pipes broke from the earthquake, not because of the flood that that meltdown started as soon as the earthquake hit. Why don't, they, why don't people want you to know that? Because you would feel very uneasy about nuclear power because there are lots of nuclear power plants that are here that are old and can't withstand earthquakes. What are the things that people don't want you to know that um, I write about? Did you know that the vice chairman of Japan's Olympic Committee has been photographed and associated with Yakuza many times? That's probably not a good thing if you want a clean Olympics. Um, did you know that the woman in charge of Japan's Public Safety Commission, which oversees the police force, has long been linked to a hate group that hates foreigners and Koreans called the Zaitokukai, and used to be sponsored by a Yakuza group as well? You can see I sort of have a theme going on here. Nelson Mandela said, the press must be free from state interference. It must have sufficient independence from vested interests to be bold and inquiring without fear or favor. I like that words, without fear or favor. Thomas Jefferson said, our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without being lost. Um, a free press is essential for a democracy. We are the watchdogs of democracy. Uh, if you kick us and silence us, um, democracy is in bad shape. Scoundrels take over the house. A long history of censorship. Before we go into the long history of censorship, let's talk about Japan's golden era of free speech, where magazines and newspapers were written with such fervor and enthusiasm that even this article published in 1925 said that the Japanese press was as good or better than the press in the United States or in England. Now, Japan did have this wonderful Taisho era of democracy, but then things got dark pretty quickly. Um, this is a wonderful book called Valley of Darkness, which describes the Japanese people in World War II. Basically, here are a few things, and I'm gonna have to look at my iPhone here to answer these because I can't remember all these dates, I am sorry. But Japan always had a newspaper law, um, which restricted um, what could be done even from the 1870s, but didn't apply it very much. Um, in 1925, the peace preservation law was passed. You know, whenever something is announced as like peace preservation, that it's usually the opposite. It's usually something terrible, like the peace and security preservation laws that were just passed in the Diet, that the ones that 90% of all scholars say are unconstitutional. So the peace preservation law of 1925 banned any writing or action that the government didn't approve of. Um, it set up the communist, it, it was supposed to prevent communism. It basically censored everything the Home Ministry introduced a nationwide system of film censorship. In the 1930s, the now military government created NHK, which was a, uh, which was a state monopoly, and 
did, pre, it, it did censorship of everything before it was even broadcast, kind of like NHK now under Prime Minister Abe. Uh, in 1937, um, Japan invaded Manchuria, and there was a lot of radio coverage of that. Um, news bulletins and commentaries, people were very excited about that. There's nothing like a war to really buff up the ratings. In uh, 1941, as Japan really got into the war, the, pre the peace preservation law was amended again, this time to allow the death penalty for certain cases of unpleasant speech, and it allowed the use of reten re retentive de detention for anyone who was deemed a risk to public peace, meaning if I thought you in the front row were going to say something that could hurt the war effort, I could just detain you indefinitely, which happens to people sometimes still in Japan's legal system for things like making artwork out of their vagina or bringing oxytocin into the country without getting a proper prescription. But they can only hold you for 23 days, technically. Um, by 1941, all magazines had to submit their issues in advance to the government, and the government would approve or not approve of them. There were a number of writers that were blacklisted and would not be published. Um, if I had been living in 1941, I would have been on top of that list. And by, this, by the spring and summer of 1945, Japan's news was basically interviews at kamikaze bases, talking to the guys going off to war. There weren't a lot of people listening to the radio. Many radios weren't working. But then, in 1945, the war ended. Um, NHK began broadcasting things about gardening, uh, children's shows, um, the United States sort of let up on the censorship, and gradually Japan um, became a full-fledged democracy. Uh, a lot of the people who were war criminals during the, this Valley of Darkness, including Kishinobosuke, Abe's grandfather, who was the Minister of Admissions, came back into power. Um, and they weren't exactly very fond of the free press, but they couldn't stop it. So Japan continued to develop as democracy. And by 2010, Japan ranked number 11 in the Reporters Without Borders World Ranking of Press Freedom. Now, that's a really impressive number. And that's like a Norwegian number. That's like something you find in Sweden. So in 2010, Japan was number 11 in the World Press Freedom Ranking. Now they are number 61. They are kind of at the level of Uzbekistan. So, so, so what happened? And, and my apology to Uzbekistan, but it is a terrible dictatorial country. Um, how low can Japan go? Why has it gone so low? Really quickly, a couple things. The 311 disaster um, scared the hell out of people. The, the Japanese government didn't want to release all the data because they worried people would panic. Um, I spoke with Kan Naoto, who was the prime minister at the time, and he told me, actually, we thought the nuclear reactors were going to go off like a chain of explosions, like sort of a Renchan at a pachinko parlor, and Tokyo would have been wiped out. We were lucky that it stopped when it did, and one of the reasons that we stopped it when it did is we realized that Tokyo Electric Power Company was more concerned about saving their reactor than actually preventing the meltdown, and then we moved forward. So uh, you have the nuclear meltdown, and then you have a meltdown of the, of the um, Democratic Party of Japan, and then you have Prime Minister Abe come into power. And when Prime Minister Abe came into power, then the ranking starts sinking lower and lower. Uh, People should have been a little worried when Abe's vice prime minister said about constitutional change, why don't we just learn from the Nazi party and sneak it past before anyone realizes what's happening? And so they have. So why has press freedom eroded so much? It's eroded because Japan has this press club system so that only the major media gets to report. So the magazines or small newspapers or internet broadcasting sites that might report something interesting don't get a fair shot. Um, there's a heavy reliance on advertising. If you write the wrong things about the wrong company, you suddenly may not have enough revenue to publish your magazine. Something many people don't know is that Tokyo Electric Power Company has a monopoly on electric power in this area. They also have the 10th largest advertising budget of any, country, of any company in Japan. Now ask yourself, if you have a monopoly, why do you need to advertise? Right? Well, you, you do need money to make sure that the press reports things that are favorable to you. Um, the State Secrets Act in 2013, this was, this was enacted also with massive protest. Um, it makes it a crime for a reporter to even ask something 
about a state secret, whether I know it's not a state secret or not. Meaning, let's say I, you, you know a state secret about uh, Japan's plans to sell nuclear reactors to China. Not that that would happen. Let's say India, that's more likely. And I keep asking you persistently about it. I don't know that's a state secret. But if it is a state secret, whether I know it or not, and I keep asking you and annoying you, then I'm instigating a leak. That's five years in jail for me, even if I don't write it, and it's 10 years in jail for you if you're a public official and you tell me. That scares the hell out of the reporters. Nobody wants to go to jail. Um, newspapers get worried, they censor themselves, and so you have gossip replacing journalism. So instead of reporting on the things that you need to know, they report on you, um, the AKB 48 elections. Things aren't helped when the Liberal Democratic Party makes statements like, let's punish the media that doesn't report for favorably on what we do by depriving them of their advertising. Now, this was such a transparent bullying of the media that all the newspapers protested. But there were two newspapers who protested the protesting because these two newspapers, one run by a very cranky old man that I sort of know, and another one that, start, that has a K in the middle of it, um, felt that, you know, why rock the boat when we're having so much fun playing golf and eating sushi with the powers that be? So what can we do about it? We can repeal the State Secrets Act. We can try and set up press clubs that are open to everyone. Um, we can keep the freedom of press rewards, and we can set up what is called a nonprofit newsroom. Now, that has been done in the United States with some success. It is a newsroom that does not rely on advertising but on donations, and it does investigative journalism and gives what it has to anyone that will publish it. It's something that Japan should seriously try, and we could do it. It would take less than half a million dollars to start one. In the United States, that has become the last refuge of serious journalism. And finally, I'm going about over time here just a little bit. I'll give you a quote. And generally, I don't like to quote people who write literature because I'm a journalist and I think people who make up stuff are silly. But this is a really good quote from Ray Badbury because it tells you why journalism and writing and knowledge is important. A stranger is shot on the street. You hardly move to help. But if half an hour before you spent just 10 minutes with a fellow and you knew a little bit about him and his family, you might just jump in front of his killer and try to stop it. Really knowing is good. Not knowing or refusing to know is bad or amoral at least. You can't act if you don't know. We can't act and we can't live as a democracy if we don't know. You as a public have a right to know and we as journalists have a duty to inform you of the things that people don't want you to know. In order to do that, we all have to work together because if we don't know, we can't act and we need to act. Thank you.